اهلا غاده هاي 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 وي ميت ا فيو مانثس اجو ان برلين ثرو ميوتشوال فريندز يس اند اي ثينك اي نو اور اور هيرد اباوت يور ورك ثرو سوشيال ميديا نوت نوينغ ذات اتس يو بيكوز يو اولسو جو ثرو دو تو ديفرنت ايدنتيتيز اون سوشيال ميديا سو both gada and um your other <laughs> <I'm not laughs> both about you. <laughs> sorry what was the question i want both identities to introduce themselves to us oh wow that's that's an intense question starting with with an identity core question okay um so i'm gada i'm 31 years old i am based in berlin germany i'm from riyadh born and raised um so i'm saudi that's really important to mention as well i have a social media account that revolves around the history of saudi Ar- of Sa- not saudi arabia alone but also the arabian peninsula as a whole mm-hmm. so that's the i would say the second identity what what happened how did what made you decide to be interested in saudi history and identity i mean it's a really long story but i'll 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 find a way to make it shorter so um a few years ago i used to okay so in 2016 i finished my law degree and i was like i'm never going to be a lawyer <laughs> this was the worst mistake i've ever made um but hey i really like politics so i would like to uh, be a researcher in politics so i became a security analyst working on or working in counterterrorism specifically women in terrorism and that was a fun job for like 3 years um and during those 3 years i was living between saudi and europe okay. and until i found myself in berlin and i was like okay i i like being here it's a, it's a nice place uh i also like my my spouse is is has is my is my spouse is german so he it, like it just happened that we were both based in berlin so i was like okay um i'll continue in this field it got a bit too much at some point i mean the the effects that you get from constantly consuming um like this kind of content uh, it it adds a lot of pressure and it adds a lot of anxiety so i was like okay this is not this is not where where i want this to go so then i just jumped into purely politics and and international relations plus media so i worked for a company a pr company and then i jumped to the embassy here in berlin and i worked for them as a media consultant uh, for 3 years and that was also a fun job and this is where it comes in um at the like during the time or time period between moving between all these jobs i was really really homesick in berlin like i hadn't made much friends yet and i wasn't really settled in yet and I had thought Germany was very similar to the US in the beginning and I was very shocked that it wasn't. So I started to just fall back into my first love which is libraries. So I would go to the libraries, I would go into the archives and I would try to find text or anything that talked about Saudi. And so I started falling into the photographs. And so I just started collecting them privately. I shared a bit online uh here and there uh and so on. And then when I started my work at the embassy, um the ambassador at the time had noticed my interest in photography and on old photographs and kind of like we started using that in the work. And at the same time um i was i started to just write more and more and more about the 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 uh, the content that i would find but mostly in english um and then i started noticing that a lot of the people that were commenting 
were speaking Arabic and they would reply in Arabic. And so then I thought to myself, they are, they have the, the right, the first right to, or to access this kind of content if it's not available. And so I did my own search and lo and behold, it's not available. So I started saying to myself, okay, like there are people out there like me who are nostalgic and homesick for something, uh, for memories, basically. Um, because in those old photographs, I see my family that I had left to live in Germany. And so that it, it strikes a, a chord in me. So I said, okay, let's just translate the text. So I started just writing in Arabic, translating a lot of the content, uh, researching more. And it just started building from there where the account kind of became like a place where people really like where I share my curiosity with people. So a lot of the content that I share, I don't know what's going on in the photographs. Um, call it ignorance, call it lack of knowledge, whatever you want to call it. But like, I'm curious to just learn. So I always want to learn from the people who know firsthand experience or have firsthand experience, or at least know factually what's going on in the photograph. And so that's that's where the 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 joy of the account comes from, is that you put the content out there, being very careful and and ethical with with what you're writing, um, and then waiting for the comments and then analyzing the comments. Um, and it's really cool because you have sometimes like anthropologists replying and then someone whose grandparents saw the photograph and says, no, that's not true. And then someone else saying like from another region in Saudi or in the in the Gulf or the peninsula as such saying, oh, well, we do that in the south. And then it's like it's a photograph from the north. And so it's just really interesting to see like these like lines of identity flowing through the texts um, from people. So yeah, that's, that's how I got into the work. It's, it's just the people. I, I love the interaction. <laughs> I will talk about the interaction in a bit because yeah. um, that's very exciting. Sometimes I see you like share um, <laughs> frustrations and amusements, but yeah. um, before yeah. that, um you have a very kind of, I guess, rich and a very important um, background. You studied law. You worked in counterterrorism yeah. about women, um, specific to women. Um, I didn't really introduce myself, but hi, everyone. I'm Tasneem Sultan. I'm a photographer from Saudi Arabia, <laughs> and I focus on women. Um, and a lot of times we discuss um, issues that maybe outsiders don't understand. So... Can you share from the law and also the counterterrorism and then media also working for an embassy, like how that's affected the way that you even collect and see photographs and like how that really defined, I guess, the visual language that you have today? Oh, wow. So so I'll tell you how each one helps. So the the law really helps in the copyrights. There is a lot of um, unethical work, in my opinion, going on in the region where, I mean, photographer, and I think you know this experience, Tasneem, where photographers' rights are being abused constantly and disrespected. And personally, I, like, when I got into this more and more, I, I kept telling myself, if there's anything I'll never do is to have a watermark on a photograph I share or claim that I own the photograph or uh, publish or make my account a platform where, you know, you generate money from advertisements um, and so on, because it's not me that made this sort of like, it, it's not me that took this photograph. It was someone else that ha had all those efforts uh, or took the, all those efforts to take these photographs. Um, so that's where the law really helps. The counterterrorism, I mean, listen, the counterterrorism really gives you a, a, a look, a certain perspective into the world um, and allows you to understand different perspectives of people that you agree or don't agree with. 
Um, so that's where it helped me because it's like, you really have to understand the human condition. Um, and you have to be very careful with it. Like you don't want to say anything that might harm people. And at the same time, you don't want to say something that might benefit people who want to harm you. So it's, it's, that's what counterterrorism taught me in the, in the ethics of the work as such. Um, as for the media, the media, I think, was the most gruesome teacher because it just taught me that there were so many biases existing out there that are so false, like just false narratives. Um, and it also kind of showed me how there are people that are insistent in staying in these false narratives because they benefit from it. Um, and I'm just someone who's like, okay, if uh, truth matters to me a lot. Um, and again, maybe that's why I, it goes back to the law because it's like the law has to be the truth. <laughs> and so um, the truth is very important to me. I mean, you can have whatever opinion you have, but don't distort facts to make things work out for you. Um, and that's, that's how all three helped in a way. Yeah. The three very much, like you said, mutually work in in what the truth is, but it's still in the eyes of the person who's viewing it. Or also there's an imbalance in power dynamics when it's the photographer. Yeah. Um, so then how do you also navigate around that when it's not your image even? So it's the caption that you're kind of looking for. Sometimes you have the caption, sometimes you don't. So how do you navigate around that? Uh, if the photographer is alive, I would email the photographer and we have like a basic conversation on on like just by email asking them. Like, for example, there's this photographer who took a photograph in the 60s, maybe no 70s, actually. Um, his name was Dennis and I asked him, so like, what were you thinking when you took this photograph? Um how did you feel? Do you feel today that if you found these people, because now he took a photograph of them as children, you know? So if you saw them as men and women, how would you feel? And, and how would you feel to interact with them again? And would you ever take another photograph and stuff like that? So then it creates like conversation. And then I, I always make sure a hundred percent that when I publish the content, I share it with the photographer and say, like, this is what the reaction is. And sometimes I even go to so far to like translating the texts that I get to the photographers to make them say, to make them understand, like, the, the, the society is quite thankful for this moment that you captured. Like there is, so it, it, it humanizes this relationship, you know, they're like, the, it, it kind of eliminates the existence of borders and p kind of shows how people are just genuinely human, you know? So it's kind of like, look at how this society is so happy to have found the people that are in the photograph. And at the same time, the same people themselves are also quite delighted to, to find one photograph. I mean, there's another example where the photographer is not alive, but it was a photograph of uh, uh, one older sister holding another younger sister. And I got a text saying that the older one was someone's mother and that he had no photographs of his mother. And but he recognized her because he had like one passport photograph left. And so he he was he like kept thanking me like, oh, my God, thank you so much. And I as much as I enjoy that, I always say like the thanks goes to actually the institution that preserved this photograph or the photographer that actually took this photograph. Um, so yeah, like I always try to bring the photo photographer up front because that's where all the work started from. If that photographer did not have the intention to go to Saudi and to take these pictures or to go to Yemen or Amman or wherever it may be in the peninsula and to take these photographs, then none of them would have existed. So the, the thanks first and foremost should go to this person and then to the institution that preserved 
these things. And then to the, also to the, to the people that add context to the photographs. So like I said earlier, a lot of the photographs that I share, sometimes I just don't know what's going on in the photograph. And I have an anthropologist explaining that. So it's, it's, it's a delight to see how like, to create just this one image to have to, or to create an understanding around this one image, you need to bring all these people in together. Um, so you can have like a 360 perspective. Yeah. So I'm going to ask first with this image, but before I ask specifically what's happening, are you focused on the Arabian Peninsula or is it Saudi? Where, where is your, it's, <laughs> It's traditionally what the Arabian Peninsula is. Plus, I'm very interested in tribal movements. Um, so that's that's my focus. So sometimes there are certain tribes, for example, they go far into the Syrian desert. Technically, that's not Arabian Peninsula old borders, but that is the extension of the culture, at least. And so that's what I find interesting. Okay, so explain this photo, please. So this photo was taken, I think, if I'm not, if I'm not mistaken, in 1912 or older. Um, it's a daha, and a daha is like a, a sort of dance from the north. Um, but before going further, I must say that in Arabian cultures, we don't say dances. We say lib, which is like playtime which I find really, really, really fun to say. And so this is a kind of play where um, a certain tribe up in the north of Arabia, they kind of get together and with this, with, with, cla or through clapping their hands, they make like lion sounds and it has a story in history, which I'm not going to go into. Um, and usually a woman performs in the past. So the I is a woman. Yeah, it's a woman. So I had a very fun interaction with this photograph. Once this photograph was published, there was a huge debate going on on Twitter, which uh, like on my account, at least, <laughs> which was um, whether or not that this was associated to that tribe. So you had some people saying it belonged to it and some people saying, no, like a woman never, never participates. And then members of the tribe saying, no, we'd like, here's a video of an old woman participating and so on and so forth. And, and I find that debate it's, as such, I find so interesting and so fascinating. Um, and it's also a way of cultural preservation and understanding things. This photograph was taken, I think if I'm not mistaken, close to Jerusalem. Um, so it, so it's tagged under Palestine in the archives. And this is my, my own, it's like, this is my own comment on archives abroad is that they, they tag things. Okay. Where they took it, but they don't understand where did it come from at least. So, so technically this was in Palestine, um, I think that's what it well, what it was written at least on on the art in the archive, mm -hmm. um, but it also like tri members from that tribe recognize that this also belongs to them culturally speaking. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So I see also that it's not just photos. You also discuss artwork. Oh yeah, this is my favorite. <laughs> I mean, so I'm so. I'm also obsessed with how other cultures see us. Um, and I mean, you always hear someone saying, oh, I love Arabian culture. And it's like, okay, is it like a thousand and one nights Arabian culture or is it like Lawrence of Arabia, Arabian culture? Um, so I'm interested in that really. And I'm, I'm, and I'm not interested in, in it to say like, oh, you got my culture wrong or you misunderstood it. But I, what I find really interesting is how things are depicted. So for example, if I'm not mistaken, this one was of Qais and Layla. And 
uh, what I found just interesting is is just how they drew both characters. I mean, in all the depictions of Qais abroad, by the way, he's drawn as skinny, like so skinny, up like as if he's starving. And Layla is just there going with food, thinking like, oh, do you want this? You can't have it. <laughs> So I, I just find it fascinating. And I find it fascinating that like MoMA f- kept this, for example, uh, in their archives and uh, preserved it. So to me, it's like, why? Why would, I mean, why not? But like, I just ask myself, like, why are they interested in it? Is there something that they see that I can't see? And so I try to like understand who the artist is. Where Who did it the artist? I have no idea. I forgot. But is it uh, a Western artist or is it someone? I think it's a Persian artist. I'm not sure. I really, I really forgot. Like okay. I posted this maybe three years ago, if I'm not mistaken. But is it on your Instagram? Can we go check? No. So my Instagram is just dedicated to black and white photographs. Oh. Um, Why and that? Huh? Why is that? Because I want it to be an experience. I don't want it to be just a page. Okay. I want it to be like a photo album. Um, so that's why. But yeah. Oh, this one, this one is of, I will not pronounce his name, Tiglathar, whatever. He's just like a Babylonian king. And the history behind this one, I find so fascinating. So there is the, there used to be an Arabian queen from Domat al-Jundil. Do you know her? Shamsi? You, you, you share. This is your story. <laughs> so there was an Arabian queen. I think I'm not sure when exactly. Like I'm so, I need to just preface this to everyone. I'm horrible with dates <laughs> and names because I just see too many of them every day. So I, and if, if the notes are not in front of me, then I will not remember. Um, but I do remember the history. So this, this guy was a Babylonian king who was just annoyed by this Arabian queen that would not follow orders. And so he constantly like sent missions to destroy her and it never worked until like one time he was like, I've had enough. I'm going to destroy you. And he did. Um, and yeah, yeah, yeah. He, 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 like she failed. And it, he was, he was so, and I, like, I thought that it was so interesting, but he was so hurt by her that he drew an entire mural, apparently in his palace, d- depicting her, dragging a donkey along instead of a camel to say like she's a donkey and and it's like why would a ruler of a great empire be so annoyed that he dedicates something this big to like a queen of a of a city in saudi not saudi at the time but like yeah. So it, it, I just find it fascinating. So he, he, he you yeah, know, he has, he's holding a grudge and he's not over it yet. He and held a like- strong grudge because everyone fell to his empire. Everyone was like, sure. Um, and she was like, no, because the thing is Arabs, historically speaking, and a lot of documents attest to this, Arabs refused throughout history to have someone rule them. They didn't care. They they didn't care if if they had like uh, blood feuds amongst themselves, and if and if they tried to fight themselves and rule themselves. But they always hated the idea and rejected the idea of being ruled over. And I mean, this was also documented by a Greek historian um, saying that the Arabs. Uh, like the Abyssinians and the Babylonians and the Assyrians, they've all tried to conquer Arabs and they couldn't. And so what they've settled with is that they have Arabs as um, mercenaries. So the Arabs were like, okay, fine, just pay us and we do stuff. Uh, But they were not okay with having someone telling them, okay, I'm your king or I'm your ruler. They, they, so I think in that context, it just annoyed him. Also, yeah, it just annoyed him that 
why is everyone accepting my rule except for her? Yeah, I don't know when this map was, to be honest. <laughs> but, but why is it interesting? See, you're just showing me things I don't remember. <laughs> but anyways, no, I do. Th this map is really interesting, though. I love maps. Maps are so interesting. Is it a flat world? Is that what they're trying to say? A flat earth? Like, is that what you think? Or is it Jehennem and heaven? Like, there's a lot going on. Yeah, so this is the peninsula. This is just the peninsula. Didn't see that one. Yeah, it's because it's flipped over. So if you flip it this way, you see the peninsula. Okay. Yeah, so it's you, you'll see a bit of Sinai and you'll see a bit of other places. It's it's I just I'm just personally fascinated with maps because maps like maps are the first visual uh, content ever like other than artwork mm. that that existed from the past that can really help us understand how our own ancestors kind of navigated through the world or at least viewed the world themselves so um like maps also help empires conquer places you know so like the dutch for example the way they conquered um Asia or South Asia, at least in South uh, East Asia, is through maps that they that they've kind of stolen also from the British because the British were like the superpower uh, that colonizers. used. Yeah, no, no, not just colonizers, but like they were so ahead of everyone else with shipwork. Yes, um, and also with trains, with building trains, and that's yeah, how it was the with them. But the trains at that point for maps didn't really matter. Um, and maybe for Europe, but like for the general um, world, it didn't matter. So that the Brits had the maps, the Dutch kind of tried their best to keep their own maps secret. Um, and and it was like, it's really an interesting thing in history. Like if you really look into colonization, uh, other than uh, other than forms of trade, if you just look at maps and look at maps from every nation from that time, you'll see how they viewed the world. Mm -hmm. And at the same time, you'll understand what what their interactions were like. So historically speaking, the peninsula has had a lot of Portuguese, Dutch, uh, British, and French interactions, but the the Dutch were the most intensive because they colonized Indonesia and Indonesians had to go to Mecca for Hajj. So the Dutch were the ones responsible to carry them through the oceans and to like just take them to Mecca. So they understood the routes very intimately. Um, um, yeah, so I, I just love maps. <laughs> I can talk about maps endlessly. Going back to photography, um, one observation that I have, and I think that's a frustration that we both shared, is a lot of times photography, especially, you know, um, at the beginning, the early stages of photography, I would say it was very westernized and it did come with a very, you know, colonizer's gaze. Mm -hmm. Do you find that or is there more information that we don't know? I I try my best to ignore the whole colonization and colonizers eyes when I first look at a photograph. It's not that it's not important. It's very important. But uh, the first thing I try to do is what can I see that I identify with? That is something that either I've seen in my own past or I've heard of. And then I, I try to dissect, okay, what's going on in the photograph? Why was, and then I start asking, why was this interesting to the photographer? Um, how could have the photographer taken the photograph differently? Why did he had or she had to do it in this angle? Um, and then when I look into when the photograph was taken and when the photographer was alive, then the whole concept of a colonizer's eyes comes in because I don't want to 
kind of put emphasis on that because then you just start coming into, into the photograph with negative feelings and thinking like, ah, why, why did they, why were they the ones that took this photograph? Why couldn't blah, 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 take this photograph and so on. Like personally, I really just don't care um, because the content is way more important to me than the factor that, 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 um, that came in for the photographer at the time for them to take this photograph. And I mean, let's be frank, the reality is so many photographs from the region are from people from abroad. Yes. So, so if you start approaching things with that perspective, then you will end up with nothing. Um, so that's why for me, it's not, not that like it's important to have there's a time frame when local photographers or Arab photographers were kind of exploring and experimenting also is there any um like I want to know if there's a if women were more photographers than men if it was western women more than Arab women or vice versa I mean I don't have the the statistics on that but from what I've seen Arab photography from the 1800, like late 1800s started, but mostly from the Levant and North Africa region. Um, the peninsula didn't have much. And I think that's not to say that, that no one was talented. It's just the materials did not survive in the region. It was too hot. Nitrate exploded from heat. Um, some film really burned, you know, when someone would just open the disc thing and, and yeah, and he, it, it was just not plausible. I mean, the, if you look at the early photographs of Mecca, a lot of them are distorted in a way and they have to fix it. Um, and it's Mecca, you know, you'd think that there were way more photographs of Mecca from the past, especially from Arab photographers who were in the region. But like, for example, the first film ever made, in my opinion, a, a full length film of Mecca is 1928. So that's pretty early. That's not late. Um, so, yeah. And then, well, again, we're going through these photos. You can kind of, you you can, I guess, have it in a timeline. Is that what you actually are working on? Or what are you working on with all these images other than sharing them on the archives and, and, and you know, entertaining and educating us? Pure, pure collection. It's it, like, you're I don't- You're not making any of them. You said you're not selling because that's not what you do. It's a pure, coll a personal collection. Like I, I don't, I don't have a timeline. I, I just have files dated uh, like let's say 1950s and I just dump the photographs in there. Um, and then sometimes each, each file just has another file with categories. So because I use it as a private archive, not something to, to gain any financial gain from it, but like on projects that I've worked on that have required archives, there is a lot to take in, especially when it comes, when the licensing comes in. Um, so, yeah. Can you explain more about licensing? Oh, man. <laughs> That's the conversation of its own. Um, I mean, what do you want to know about licensing? So I'm a photographer and I see a lot of photographers' names here who are listening. Um, a lot of us don't really understand how we can sell, what our rights are with photography. So from someone who's a collector slash archivist slash lawyer. Um, I'm not a lawyer. I am not, I'm not licensed to give legal advice. <laughs> I just still have the, the, you know, is it framed yeah, is but it in your house? Like, but I cannot get, it's like a doctor, like someone who can't, who doesn't practice medicine can't give you a medicine, you know, like I can't, I'm a not doctor practicing. can always tell me what to get from the pharmacy. Yeah, if no, I'm no. just saying like a, a not licensed doctor, like if someone anymore, still, but you yeah. were, I've never been a lawyer. Really? You studied it, but you didn't even go to... Why? Wow. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I've never practiced. I thought like 
you did it for a bit, like a year. I left school and I said, this is not for me. We're going to have another talk because I really want my daughter to become a lawyer. It's just another, no, no, (laughs) no. It's another conversation. You can't be a doctor, an engineer. Why don't you go to law school? Okay, okay. But you but you still have that as a background. Let's not pretend that you didn't study law. Like that still wasn't. I I, I can talk about it, but I can't give legal advice. That's what I'm saying. Okay, not legal (laughs) advice, but tips. Again, uh, you you studied law. We're not gonna remove that. I mean what's what's so important for the for a photographer to know is where they're from like their place of residence because then the the copyright laws of your place of residence applies and that's it and where you sold the photographs so let's assume for example you take your photographs and you sell it to national geographic and you have some rights in those photographs um like let's say royalty rights So then the photograph is owned by them. So if I take the photograph from the website and publish it and make magazines out of it and make money out of it, you have no right to come and complain to me, even though it's like a partial right. But because you sold the rights to the National Geographic, they're the ones who kind of send a cease and desist to the person. And then after a cease and desist, they might send like a a suit And it's like, if I land in the States, I find out I'm being sued and so on and so forth. I mean, that's the complicated thing with copyrights is that not all countries have the same copyrights. And this is where it does get complicated. And this is why certain countries easily violate more than other countries. Um, So yeah, that's that's all I can say. Okay. Yeah. Second question. Um, and I'm, please, everyone who's listening, please ask and send us your questions and comments um, because we'll start having that conversation in a bit. Um, what about captioning? A lot of times you've shared that you find that the photographer is dead. So then what happens? Uh, I try to find who owns the photograph. Most times when a photographer is dead, They had already, before dying, sold the rights to some kind of image place. Either it's Getty Images or uh, Magnum Photos, if they're a Magnum Photo photographer, um, sometimes National Geographic, sometimes Archives. I mean, like, for example, um, a famous, he's actually one of my favorites, he's called Elo the Pirate, Ilo Battagelli, he's Italian, and he loves to call himself Ilo the Pirate. Um, and he dressed like a pirate. Um, facts. I, I have the photograph. I have the proof. Um, so he, before dying, he donated his entire collection to the Pitts Rivers Museum at Oxford. And he gave the rights to his daughter, I think, and the daughter also signed away the rights to the to the museum. So it's 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 a lot of research, honestly, because you have to find out if this person is alive or dead. Um, so you go through a lot of obituaries, um, and then if 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 you're certain that they're dead, then you try to find relatives. Um, but mostly, most of the content are the archives are very clear about the location. So, yeah. Someone shared more um, about the Leila. Is it Leila? No. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. Um, If anyone wants to follow more on that story. But also, (laughs) yeah, yeah, yeah. (laughs) I think we all have, we all have these um, fictional characters that we, or maybe not, are they fictional or not fictional in your experience? they're not fictional they're they're up in my opinion they're not they're actually photographed so if i don't know i mean uh, is william shakespeare real (laughs) that shows a lot of speculation you know if the guy was actually wilmina or something so it's like yeah there's a 
every there's a lot of things that you can speculate about but like i believe that that these people at least in some way or form existed even if they were fictional they've become so ingrained into culture yeah that they're that they cannot be not real they are very real you know so to me they're very real can you share with us um a bit of the comments that you receive when you post images I mean, I get a lot of mixed comments. Majority are positive. Mm-hmm. Some are are hilarious. Um, and some are unfortunate. I <laughs> just let me put it that way. But also I'll just stick to the hilarious and the positive ones. So like like I said, in the positive ones, you sometimes get people saying, Oh, so go back to the second picture the one before after this that one so for example the one before that one ali uh, sadu ah sadu lahba this one i love it i love this photo so a lot of people like like when i published this photograph a lot of people were like let's say like an anthropologist started explaining what the sadu is and like oh see where why the pot is next to the sadu because like it adds uh, it, it it weighs the the wooden thing so that she can like weave into the sadhu um oh see why the children are around because like at the time it was entertaining for them to watch it and so this is like a positive comment you know but also <laughs> could we believe that it was all staged for the photographer 100% Okay, so we're yeah, we're good on that. A hundred percent that like the, the, there is this understanding that this is this is not spontaneous. You know, they are sitting all down in a very like calm way, especially the children, you know. So it's it's it there is a level of of speculation. But like a hilarious comment would be like, um, like oh the kids are watching tv or like uh oh, oh if our kids who watch tv today would see this they would like go to the kitchen and start helping us from from and and kind of kiss our feet and say thank you and stuff like that so i mean i'm not being funny right now because really the comments sometimes are just hilarious but um Yeah, and sometimes they make it like about me, like I'm the one who's wearing like some some people really don't believe that these photographs are real. They think that they are staged because of the quality and that's something I'm I'm very keen on achieving all the time is quality of photographs. So sometimes I have comments saying like yeah, don't you fear God that you lie to people? that you that you hired all these actors and brought them all together and told them to sit in a specific way and then took the photograph and then published it and i mean i commend the person for thinking i'm this wealthy a and b i'm this i have this much free time and c that i fly to berlin and saudi like in a day <laughs> i mean If you were a western photographer that had this assignment maybe that and you were hired by a big publication you know let's dream um but i guess my question from me being a saudi local photographer um two one is i i notice at least in my own work that we don't like criticism um we like to hold a per- and this is not saudi i think this is um not even an, a, a global south i'll say um if i'm not generalizing more than at least the arabs let's stick with the arabs i know that all arabs we have you know not just a reputation to hold but an image like we want to look perfect and great and clean and and like every everyone's fed off even if we're not great you know we're not doing so well so whenever i photograph any image that i find is in a documentary manner I do some especially at the beginning I would get a lot of comments of like um, in Arabic cat fashlin now you know you're you're why are you embarrassing us why are you airing your dirty laundry and I'm like it's just a guy having a picnic on the street which is a norm in our society it's not mm-hmm. it's not it's not in any way saying something bad and the person saw me photographing them and they think that's okay so but we find we find we're very sensitive I guess to criticism I I yeah. I I I see where you're coming from but 
let me let me just say this. I think this is something to an extent shared globally because no one ever wants to look bad in a picture. And keep in mind, photography, when it first started, was more for commemorative moments. So even, I mean, there was a time in Victorian, in the Victorian era where they had, they literally had dead people pose for photographs um, and like just sit there with like people trying to pull like a smile so that people at least have a memory of this dead person smiling. Um, and so I think everyone wants to, to look at visuals and keep thinking of positive thoughts when they, when they see these things. So like stuff like, oh, um, my grandfather was happy. So I have that good memory of him. So I don't want to change that memory. Um, and I think... So I think that's one part of it, the, the need to have something positive all the time. Another part of it, I think, really is due to our own history of having people tell stories on our behalf. This is why we get defensive. It's because every time, even, even someone sitting at a picnic, uh, having a picnic with, with their family, someone somewhere will find a problem with that photo graph and say oh look at how why she's wearing a abaya oh look at how the man is distant from her oh look at this and that and this and so i think from our perspective we're just tired and exhausted of the nitpicking that people see in these photographs and so that's why we get a bit defensive about it um and then the third part which plays a lot in in how i also interact with people is just the shock. They are just shocked because they have not never in their lives seen visuals like this. And the only visuals of, of things like this. So for example, um, a photograph comes to mind right now. It was, uh, it was from Ilo, Batjali. Um, it was in the desert and he took a photograph of two Bedouin women holding their children. And the children obviously had clear signs of starvation. Um, and this photograph was taken in 1945. Um, and it was at a time when the country was like developing really fast. So a lot of the people in the commentary were just shocked. Like how, and some people were like, how dare you post something like this? Um, we're a very progressive society now. And, and, and um, we, we, um, it's not that we're ashamed of this, but it's like, we're over this now. And my perspective is different. It's just different than theirs, where it's like, I would rather see these photographs to thank God for the development that we've had, considering how fast it was. Um, and at the same time to say, to 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 kind of honor the people in the photographs for having to go through these tough times to give us the luxury luxurious lives we live in right now i mean i think i always think if you tell these people like if you could just jump into these photographs and tell these people the lives we live i think they would say that is heaven um so i so that's that's how i look at it personally like I, I always try to treat people's emotions and reactions to photographs as authentically theirs and i try to understand where they're coming from and i after like figuring out at least how they're thinking i try to also put that perspective whenever i look at a photograph and i try telling myself would this is upset someone and why would it upset someone and how could it upset someone uh it doesn't stop me from posting it but it at least makes me more cautious um of not offending anyone so yeah that's my two cents no, no, thank you. Actually, that's really, I appreciate that. And it does put everything into perspective of how we are very lucky to be where we are today. Yeah. Um, where we are today, also speaking of which, do you usually ask 
Saudis to give you these images? Are you like how are you finding it? How do you see that families, Saudi families specifically, are um, are they cooperative in giving you archival images of their families in history, or are they cautious? This is this is a such a sensitive topic that I have never dared to jump into. The reason is is because of a lot of the privacy laws going on in the world. Um, it, it's all fine if I have an institution and I, as an institution, put out a call to say, if you have an archive you would like to donate, um, please contact blah, blah, blah. But as a standalone researcher, that is so such a sensitive topic because let's say the father owns the archive. And so the father comes to you and he hands you the archive or a copy of the archive. The father passes away, Allah Yerhama. The descendants own the archive now and they don't want any of the content ever shared. And so that's that's when it gets complicated and sensitive because you are dealing with very, very private content. That content that that no one had wanted to go into the public space except for one person who owned, who was like the head of the house, you know? Um, so I always tread very, very carefully with private stuff. I don't mind people sharing me the photographs and saying, oh, da, oh, look at this photograph. Oh, it's so cool. And I say, oh, it's so cool. But if someone asks me to publish it, I always refrain from doing so. Um, be, mostly out of respect to to others that might participate in personal archives. I always personally also offer help for personal archives in the sense of like, okay, how should you preserve a photograph? Um, where should you take it? If you don't want it to be photocopied, this is what you should do. Have agreements, have NDAs if you want to share the content with people assigned certain photographs that you have and that these photographs are for, let's say, um, use or commercial use or editorial use or whatever use you may want it to be, and then add a value to the photograph and then lock the other photographs in your archive. Um, so that's that's what I do with, with private stuff. I, I try to be very cautious about it. Outside your profession, who do you work, admire, and inspired by? I can ask you these questions, but the time is gone. So, but, <laughs> I, I, I mean, I can go quick. I mean, yeah. Uh, okay, who would you love to shadow for a day, past or present? Tasneem Sultan. That's you see, though. No, that seriously, I would love to join you on something and see what you're doing. Um, I mean, the thing is, I'm 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 too awkward to want to shadow anyone, so I just observe people online, you know. So that's that's my thing. You've uh, also observed in person, like you followed me and and my shenanigans. I'm not in stalker. I'm not a stalker, though. I need to. Not know. a stalker. Not a stalker. Not shadowing me. Um, you can. Uh, we will collab. I would love to collaborate with you. And I think anyone who has any questions about archiving images and understanding the region's photography, especially historically speaking, um, um, I they should reach out to you. And is that just at Sagada Al Manna on Instagram? No, G Abal Khel. Oh, yeah. Okay. What do most people misunderstand about your work? That it's just Google search. <laughs> this is one of my favorite comments I once got. All you do is just put a keyword in Google and, and download the photo and put it on Twitter. You don't do much work. I mean, you also need them to be dead and not Arab. I feel like that's, you can't, you will not go to an Arab Saudi listen, family and ask No, listen, it. even if the photographer was Arab, I would never do that. <laughs> it's just like... Uh, it just makes me laugh. It's like one of my favorite comments. And how many how many years old does your images have to be to be in your you know archive? Like, can my images of two thousand fifteen? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Archive? Any 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 kind of image, even if an image was taken yesterday, I add it to an archive. But 
this is where the, the topic of usage comes in. Because I'm still alive. You're still alive. And I need to ask your permission. I need to, uh, if you don't give it to me, I can go buy your permission from someone else. Um, so it, yeah, it gets complicated. So I, I actually buy some photographs. Like I, 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 I have even some photographs. Yeah. I've seen her house is amazing. If you're any, any of you are in Berlin so um, that I bought, I mean, oh. I don't have the rights, so I'm just going to do this, but no, I can, I can just quickly like, so I like have, so it depends also when you are even, even if you're sharing those photos and publishing them, but that does not always mean that you Rada, can hang them in your house. That's just yeah. for other yeah. work. Yeah. Um, is I, there a future collaboration or future projects that we should all know about? Keep watching. <laughs> I mean, honestly, I'm working on a lot, but most importantly, I started a master's in media and visual anthropology. So I, um, the next two years, I'll be working on like um, documentaries, documentary photography, understanding the anthropo anthropological side of it. Mm -hmm. uh, but I'm mostly interested in, in the VR world. Um, so it's, uh, yeah, we'll see where it takes me. I can't wait, to be honest. I really want to see where it does take you. So, okay, so it's Ghadir Mahanna, G-A, Belkhair, on Instagram. I love your logo, by the way. It's really cool, Thank like you. your name. Um, I wish my name was as cool to be with <laughs> Um Please show and share and post um, your feedback um, at afikra.com bats. That one. Um, <laughs> which is good. Um, and please stay in touch on all of our social media platforms. We're on Instagram, Facebook, email us. Um, Rada, honestly, do you want to share anything? Do you feel like we should, we need to, you know, say something? I mean, thank you, everyone. I, I appreciate that you heard me for one hour. Uh, I even don't have the patience for myself. That's why I, I'm silent most of the day. <laughs> um, and thank you, Tasneem. Honestly, like, I like this has been a great interview. I've enjoyed this so much. Um, and yeah, I enjoy your photography a lot. So maybe one day I'll start to post your pictures if you give me the rights to them. I will give you all the rights if I get paid really well and my daughters can live for the next two generations very well. And no, um, I'm not you know, all of my images will be in an exhibition. I don't have into my crazy mind. Um, I don't have that kind of, yeah. We'll see. Maybe I'll, I'll start a, a fund for foot photography. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You and I see a lot of, again, mutual familiar names here that I'm hoping that once I'm dead, you will help my daughters secure my life. <laughs> why, why are you starting to say things like this? <laughs> and, and you'll have not just the law degree experience, but a lot of experience now with your master's. I can't wait to really discuss that also with you. Um, but thank you again, everyone, for listening and for being patient. Um, and I look forward to seeing all your future endeavors, Rada, and, and speaking with many and meeting with many Thank of you in person very soon. Inshallah. Take care, everyone. Have a good night. Bye, everyone. Bye.